Okay, all right. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for taking the time out of your preparations to be here with us tonight. Uh, my name is David Lotch, and I am the genealogy librarian for the East Baton Rouge Parish Library. Uh, it is certainly an honor to host tonight's program. Uh, I never imagined I would be doing this remotely, but um, I never imagined it's become something of a theme this year. Anyway, joining us this evening from her home is journalist and author Libby Copeland, who just this March published a book called The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are. On her website, Libby describes herself as a cultural spelunker, and her resume certainly lives up to that. Uh, as a journalist, she has covered some of the biggest cultural stories of our age and has explored a broad range of topics from celebrity profiles to how enforced modesty has uh, led to a rise in multiple sclerosis. Uh, this program will explore the extra excuse me, I'm going a little too fast here. This program will explore the extraordinary cultural phenomenon of home DNA testing, which is re redefining family history. It will draw on Libby Copeland's years of research for her book, The Lost Family which the Wall Street Journal has called a fascinating account of lives dramatically affected by genetic sleuthing. With more than 35 million people having been tested, the tipping point has been reached. Virtually all Americans are affected whether they have been tested or not, and millions have been impacted by a significant revelations in their immediate families. So without any further babbling from me, please welcome Libby Copeland. And Libby, if you'd like to make a few introductory remarks about how you came to write the book and what, what the book meant to you as you were doing it, please. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, David. It's lovely to meet you. Um, and I'm very excited to be in the East Baton Rouge Parish Library. Um, so uh, I, I wrote The Lost Family. I started writing it um, in 2017, and it was originally a, um, a, some reporting I was doing for a newspaper article in the Washington Post, um, which is my old paper. Um, and I got really interested in this idea that um, technology was shaping human behavior. Um, and that um, there could be unintended consequences for a technology that was envisioned as purely recreational, which is how um, consumer DNA testing, um, which is now a very big business um, that's been around exactly 20 years, um, how this technology uh, was sort of marketed as something that was fun um, and sort of low cost, low investment. Um, uh, DNA testing can cost anywhere from 99 bucks to, if there's a sale, sometimes it's as little as 49 bucks. Um, and um, for the vast majority of people, it tends to be something that, um, you know, they find out a little bit more about their genetic ancestry and that's it. Um, but I was very interested in this subset of people who either start out looking to answer a question um, about their own families um, or uh, they don't start out with a question at all. And in the results, they find a mystery that they then have to unravel. Yeah. And so um, I started the reporting for this, this piece in the Washington Post. And after the piece ran, I, I started to get emails from people who had read the story and wanted to share their own DNA testing experiences. And then within the first few weeks, I had over 400 emails from people, mostly in the US, but also abroad, who said, you know, I did DNA testing on a lark, I did this for fun, and it, it you know, it profoundly changed my life. And I started to interview these people, I started to talk to them, I spent um, hours on the phone with them. And I realized that this was a kind of a cultural change, a, a, a change that was happening broadly on a cultural level, um, more narrowly on a familial level, family to family, as these revelations kind of ricocheted across families. And then at its most intimate level, um, it was happening to people's identities. It, uh, you know, the revelations that are contained in a tube, whether you spit into a tube or you swab your cheek and put it into the vial and send it in, um, they can profoundly affect how people think about themselves, uh, how they understand their orientation on this earth, how they understand the relationship to their family and to their parents who um, sometimes genetic testing can reveal they're not genetically related to. So, um, I, you know, I, as I gathered these stories, I thought to myself, uh, this needs to be a book because this is not um, just a series of newspaper articles. This is not something that's affecting uh, just a handful of people. This is a very, very common experience that's happening to very many Americans and is going to happen to many more in the decades to come. And we really need to be talking about it. And that's how that's how the last family came to be. Okay. 
um, your title, The Lost Family, refers in part to a woman named Alice Collins Pleba. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, it's pronounced Playbuke. Playbuke, okay. And her quest to uncover her heritage. And this story and this story frames the broader ethical and social issues you discuss. Can you go into detail about how her story is a window into these issues? Yeah, absolutely. So Alice, um, Alice was an early adopter of DNA testing technology. So DNA testing, as I mentioned, has been around for just exactly 20 years. The first company to offer um, recreational genetic testing sent out its first tests in April of 2000. And around um, a decade later, um, something called autosomal DNA testing came on the scene. And that's the kind of DNA testing that we're all familiar with. And autosomal DNA testing can reveal, um, for instance, those um, ethnicity estimates, those pie charts that you may be familiar with if you've ever done DNA testing or know someone who has. And the, and the pie chart says you're 13% uh, um, Korean and you're 12% Nigerian and you're 10% Swedish and you know British and whatever else you are. Um, and it also can show you uh, genetic relatives uh, along both your maternal side and your paternal side. It can show you first cousins, it can show you half siblings, it can show you fourth cousins. Um, and so Alice was somebody who had a background in technology. She was incredibly good at um, information, information analysis. She has a mind that is, um, really acute at understanding both the details of data and the big picture of data. And she had recently retired. And in 2012, she decides to test through Ancestry, which is the biggest company out there for this kind of DNA testing with the biggest database, um, just to find out a little bit more about her Irish heritage. She knows she is mainly Irish on both sides, no questions there, and no big genealogical conundrums. She's just kind of curious to see if she can unravel a bit more, particularly along her father's side. Um, so she tests and she, she tests in 2012 when Ancestry has just unveiled its autosomal DNA test. So it's really new. In fact, it's not even officially on the market yet. It's, it's still in beta. And she gets these results that make no sense to her. Instead of this one um, pie chart that's sort of all one color that says, you know, British Isles or Irish, uh, she gets something that is split down the middle. One side is Irish British Isles, and the other side is something that she would later come to understand um, as Ashkenazi Jew, which is Jews from um, Eastern and Central Europe. And she did not understand how this could be. You know, she knows her, knows her genealogy along both sides, and she sets off on this kind of um, quest to understand. At first, she thinks, well, you know, this test isn't ready for prime time. They probably uh, don't even really know what they're doing. And she, you know, actually goes so far as to email the company to say, uh, you know, you guys, you know, your science isn't up to snuff yet. And it turns out, in fact, that that their science is correct. And it's it's she who has her family history wrong. And she has to understand why. And the reason I mentioned earlier, um, you know, her kind of incredible mind for data analysis and her experience with technology is it becomes it becomes very important because what she basically winds up having to do is build a database of her own DNA. She winds up looking at the thousands and thousands of genetic relatives who show up in the database for herself and her six uh, siblings and trying to piece together based on teeny tiny little overlapping genetic segments uh, piece together her identity and understand, you know, how she could be um, half this unexpected genetic ancestry. Now, Alice's story is very interesting. And the reason I chose it is because um, it's basically a classic whodunit. It's true. Uh, it's nonfiction, but it reads like, I think, um, Oh, the Washington Post said it reads like an Agatha Christie, Agatha Christie novel. So, you know, you're just so surprised at every turn. And the reason that you're surprised by Alice's story is because none of the explanations that would typically explain why someone gets an unexpected DNA result like hers, none of them turned out to be the explanation for her particular instance. So um, this gives me an opportunity in the book, and I'll talk about it a little right now, to talk about why do people typically get unexpected um, DNA results? So the most common um, sort of kind of DNA surprise is um, something called an NPE, 
which is a term that you may not be familiar with, but is so commonplace within the world of those who do genetic testing that you know NPE is like something that everyone kind of understands, it's shorthand. And it stands for non-paternity event or not parent expected. And it's the experience of discovering that one or both of your parents is not genetically related to you. And that is typically uh, a situation with one's father. So, um, you know, if Alice had been the product of, for instance, of, um, you know, her mom having a relationship outside of her marriage um, and her father being someone other than she thought she was, you know, the man that she thought of as her father uh, or her genetic father being someone other than the man she called dad, that would have been sort of the most prosaic explanation for her situation. And this happens to many, many, many Americans and people from other countries who are testing. We just happen to be in the databases more than anyone else. And it's such a common experience. And yet it is very, um, can be very shocking and painful and disruptive to someone's life. Um, but it's not that for Alice. Neither is it the case that she is adopted, which is another theory she explores. Neither is it the case that she is donor conceived. Um, which, you know, for many people, that is the explanation. Um, and neither is it the case that her family um, sort of assimilated themselves out of their original ethnic or genetic ancestry identity, right, which is something else that I explore in the book. So the kind of most common explanations for this scenario are not um, what explains her, her surprising situation. And it takes her two and a half years to unravel the truth. And along the way, I sort of use her, her fascinating story as the spine, the spine of the story. And along the way, I get to explore many other tales from people who, you know, for whom it is in fact an NPE or it is in fact an adoption, someone adopted and never told or, um, or a donor, you know, somebody who, you know, was not told that they were conceived by donor sperm or um, their, their um, family, you know, hid their genetic ancestry for various reasons. Um, uh, and um, I think that that works really well because I think it allows Alice to kind of encapsulate all the different um, ways in which um, in which these surprising results can 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 kind of play out, and then more deeply um, why they have such profound repercussions for our understandings of ourselves. You know, why does it matter so much? Um, that, you know, that we got our own family histories wrong. Why does that matter in the present day? And um, as I tell these stories, and many of them are from the people who emailed me after my original newspaper article came out and I forged a relationship with them and talked to them over the course of many months and sometimes years. Um, they tell me that, that these, these revelations of identity are things that they continue to process for years and years and years. And in fact, it may be something that goes on for the rest of your life. Thank you. Uh, and how are how common are these MBEs turning out to be? That yeah, I know you mentioned that in the book, but are, are we discovering now that they're more common than we thought they were? About as common as we thought they were, or you know? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know. The problem is that the DNA testing companies don't keep statistics, at least they don't keep statistics that they publicize. So they won't say what percentage of people going in, you know, find out they're not genetically related to the man they think of as their father. Um, and even if they did, it would be a bit tricky because there is this, this kind of factor of self-selection, right? Perhaps you could argue that the people who are going into testing, particularly people going on into it in the first, you know, five or six or seven years, are going in with a question or going in because they always had a slight suspicion about, you know, maybe that their dad wasn't genetically related to them. And so they went into this DNA testing to confirm or to disprove their theory. Um, what we do know is that um, NPE rates across cultures are generally said to be 1.9%, so just under 2%. And that's based on a pretty good cross-cultural meta study that, um, that I've, I've found that a number very smart scientists, um, you know, also pointed me to. Um, so I think the two most common scenarios that you see coming out of DNA testing, um, or the two most common surprise scenarios, I should say, um, are either that you're not genetically related to your dad, or that you have a sibling or half sibling you didn't know about, which could be because you're not related to the man you think of as your father, but it also could be that one of your parents had a child, um, either um, you know during your parents' marriage or before your parents' marriage, 
Um, and that child, you know, was in another family, was adopted out. Um, and so of those two most common scenarios, um, I've estimated based on conversations with genetic genealogists and population geneticists that we're probably somewhere in the low single digits, conservatively speaking. When you parse that out across 35 million people, uh, which is the number of people who've uh, undergone or the number, number of DNA kits that have been sold by the four major companies, there's minor overlap, but it's pretty much 35 million people. Um, you're looking at well over a million people who've discovered just one of these two major scenarios. But as I said, there are many more. And um, so if you think about how a single revelation refracts across a family, let's say I discover that I'm not um, genetically related to my father. Well, that has implications for me, of course, but it also has implications for the man who raised me. It has implications for my mother and for their relationship. And it has implications for my siblings who are now discovering that I am their um, genetic half sibling. And um, we're all kind of starting to wonder about the conversations we've had within our family and questions we had about growing up. And suddenly it explains certain things and certain conversations are becoming really awkward. And maybe I'm angry at my mom and all sorts of things are happening. Meanwhile, over in another family, I've got a genetic dad who I've just discovered. And maybe I've decided to reach out to him and forge a relationship with him. Um, and many of those stories are ones I try to tell in the book, all the different ways that, that can play out. So um, let's say that I've attempted to forge a relationship with my genetic father. Now he knows about me if he didn't already. Um, his wife and he are affected by it. His children have now discovered that they have a new half sibling. So my act of spitting into a tube has the capacity to affect, again, conservatively speaking, say eight to 10 people. Yeah. So when you think about the impact that DNA testing is having on Americans you know, across the culture, you're talking about many, many, many millions of Americans who are affected by the fact that the era of genetic family secrets is is over. Yeah, true. Have you been tested? Yes, I've I've tested myself three times. Um, and why? Because there are different databases. Um, so the major companies are Ancestry, which currently has um, 18 million people in its database. 23andMe, which comes in second at about 12 million, MyHeritage, and, um, and then Family Tree DNA, which is the oldest company. Um, and each one of them has you know, their own proprietary sauce to tell you what your ethnicity estimate is. And they also have their own database of people who've tested. So if I tested Ancestry and I'm looking for, I don't know, a first cousin, my first cousin tested at 23andMe, good luck finding that person unless unless she also happened to have tested at ancestry because the two databases can't talk to each other so people who are curious about this looking to do their family history looking to understand their genealogy looking to get a little bit more information about their genetic ancestry or compare those ethnicity estimates across different companies because they're not always perfect will yeah. often test it more than one company and try and kind of piece together information that way and so that's why i've tested at three different companies also, okay. because I was reporting on it, I really wanted to understand it from the inside out. Any surprises? Um, so we had a really kind of wonderful uh, experience as a family um, with testing. Um, on my father's side, we found, um, we were able to connect with a second cousin um, in Sweden. So my dad's grandmother came over in the 1890s um, from Sweden and, um, it turns out, and we would not have known this but for DNA because there's basically a break in the line. Um, in other words, we couldn't have reconstructed this with a paper trail. There weren't, there weren't records to tell us this. But it turns out that my dad has a second cousin who's living in Sweden and his daughter was in the database, or her daughter, I should say, was in the database um, and was very into genealogy and knew immediately when our DNA showed up uh, who we were and where we were in sort of the family lineup. And we started talking to her. And it turned out she had all sorts of information um, about our family. And we wound up going to Sweden in late 2019 um, to meet to meet her and her mother, my dad's second cousin. There was like a language barrier because we don't speak Swedish and my dad's second cousin didn't speak English. So her daughter acted as translator. And it was like absolutely remarkable to me it, as a lesson in how immediate and how 
how present the past is, right? Because if you think about it, the 1890s seems like an impossibly long time ago. But if I say to you second cousin, that's actually not that distant of relation, right? And the idea that we could meet his living second cousin and we could have this incredible connection to the past, it made things feel like not so long ago. We were able to see um, my great grandmother's um, farmhouse or at least the foundations of it. We were able to see her, her school and her church. We were able to touch a piece of family furniture that I think her uncle had owned. And it was just this incredible immediacy to the past. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, on my mother's side, uh, we found a second cousin who, um, my mother's side is Ashkenazi Jewish, and we did not know that we had living relatives who had survived in Europe along one particular line. So we had assumed um, her, her grandfather came over and didn't like kind of speak about um, anyone he left behind and as far as we know didn't keep up with them. We find out through the database that, in fact, um, my mom has a second cousin who was born in Ukraine and that this branch of the family who were, who were Jews somehow survived whatever, you know, whatever the 20th century threw at Jews in Ukraine at that time, right? So you've got to assume pogroms, obviously World War II, the rise of the USSR, and then emigrated to Israel and eventually to New York. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and, and I tell those stories because, um, you know, the book that I've written, I've tried really hard to be very nuanced in terms of, you know, not being overly, um, uh, it, it's not a cautionary message. It's not like, it's not like beware and don't test. I, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think that this technology is, is here to stay. And, and I think that people discover kind of fascinating, amazing things. And even when they're not looking for them and initially don't want them, um, they tell me they're often glad to know, um, although those on the flip side um, who are being contacted are not always, but it's always a nuanced and complicated situation when there's a surprise. And with genetic testing in general, coupled with family history, um, yeah, there are complications, there are privacy concerns, we can talk about that, um, but and also. Uh, there are these incredible discoveries that can be made. And I think it's important to kind of think about like both sides of the coin. Yeah, it, it is a fantastic and amazing technology. And like any technology, it's going to have, well, like you said, good and bad sides. I mean, I have discovered a third cousin who was adopted and I didn't know existed. And, I, and then I helped him uh, identify his father. Wow. Uh, yeah. And my wife also was adopted and she was tested and I used those results and we've in contact and she's got a great relationship with her birth mother now that we were able to to do just as she lives here in town, which made it very much That's easier. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. But then I've also had patrons come in and say like, well, she was an African-American woman and she said, well, why do I have all these white people? You know, these, I, I recognize these people. These are, these are all my mother's people, but who are all these white people that I don't recognize? And then she realized that her mother had been keeping a secret from her whole life that she had, you know, that her father was not the man who raised her. It was this guy from North Louisiana that she never met. Wow. You know? And I had to sit there face yeah. to face with her and explain to her, this is what's going on. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so, so I've, I've seen both sides of this. Yeah. Do people bring in their DNA results to you as, as the genealogy librarian and say, help me? Sometimes, yes, they will do wow. that. And most of the time, it's, you know, it's adoptees seeking parents. And we're very often able to help them or at least push them on the right path. Because as you know, it can be a very long and complex process. Yes. And sometimes, you know, there's these heartbreaking moments where, you know, that they don't teach you about in library school, where you have to explain to somebody, you know, you're living a lie, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's it's a really interesting. I mean, I in my reporting, I interviewed a number of search angels, mm -hmm. and um, search angels. You, you, I'm sure you know what they are, but I'll I'll just explain it for anyone watching who doesn't. So, that's a kind of a grassroots group of mostly women who um, you know arose in the last ten years, and mm -hmm. mostly you know in these Facebook groups. There's there's Facebook groups for a lot of these um, you know genetic testing, um, recreational DNA testing, and and you know figuring things out and every kind of um, category of, of, of experience that you could go through with DNA testing, there's a Facebook group for it. Yeah. And so Search Angels um, will help you find your immediate family members for free. 
and um, they are not as needed now as they used to be just a mere three years ago, which in uh, the world of this technology is a very long time ago, right? Once upon a time is 2017. Um, nowadays, because the databases are so big, you're very likely to get a second cousin or a closer match, um, mm -hmm. which makes it really easy, as you know, if you're an adopted person, for instance, to to quickly, maybe even on your own, find your way to your birth mother, if that's who you're looking for. But once upon a time, again, three or four years ago, you might yeah. have had just like third and fourth cousins, which is really, really hard. And um, the search angels would step into the gap. And sometimes they were people who had themselves been adopted and had themselves already done this work. And now we're looking to help other people. And you know they were volunteering their time. And so one of the things that I would ask them, um, you know, is like, how do you handle those situations, the kinds of situations you're talking about, right? Like where um, you have to gently lead someone to, to the news that, you know, for instance, no, these results are not a mistake. You actually have a half sister, yeah. right? With all that that implies about um, your father's loyalties to your mother and your parents' yeah. relationship, right? Or and, and all the questions that you want to ask that maybe you can ask now or maybe you can't ask because your parents have passed away. Um, and, you know, there's there's almost like a kind of a, a of an ethical code, um, not, not something that I would say has been written written up, although um, there are some sort of guiding principles for genetic genealogists, but more so kind of casual conversations that search angels will have with each other um, where they'll talk about, gosh, I had this. I had this terrible, you know, experience where, you know, we're doing the research on the computer at the same time. And I suddenly realized that, oh my gosh, you know, this woman's not genetically related to her father and she doesn't know it. And now I've got to tell her and the awkwardness of that. And what's interesting to me is the burden that it places on people to, to be their own bioethicists. Um, search angels oftentimes have experience, they've done this before, but a lot of times this is falling on the shoulders of say, uh, you know, the family historian who decides to test her, her great aunt because she knows that her great aunt's DNA could be the key to finally figuring out that colonial line. And then there's, some, there's something surprising in that. And she's got to decide, am I gonna tell her? Uh, that something's a little bit off and not what I expected, or should I just like let it be? And you hear stories about, for instance, children having to tell their mom that she's donor conceived, right? What a position to be put in. Um, and what's very interesting to me, and, and part of what I wanted to explore in the book is this idea of, you know, the, the unintended consequences of technology and then how that technology plays out in people's lives and all the things that it raises, all the, all the kind of bioethical quandaries that we're suddenly faced with and, and, and you had no idea what you were getting into, right? And then how does it play out? How do you, how do you write that first letter to your, to your donor father? You've discovered your donor conceived at age 42 and you've figured out his identity and now you're gonna write him a letter. You know, how do you craft it? Like, how is he going to respond? How long do you wait for a response? Do you send it through Facebook Messenger if you've figured out, you know, his identity through Facebook and you're hoping it doesn't go to his other inbox? Do you send him a letter? Do you send him an email? Do you send him a letter through certified mail? Yeah. Um, these are all things that people think about. And then the, the actual like way that the person on the other side responds and so many of these stories that I, I tell in the book, I'm trying to tell a bit of a 360, right? Like, how does the other person on the side respond? And then, and then like, what, what does the person who is seeking contact to do with that? And, and what kind of relationships are being forged here? When are people able to be kind of open hearted? Um, and like, yeah, sure, your family come on in. And when are they shutting down? And why? Um, and those stories are very beautiful. They're, they're heartbreaking, they're heartwarming, but they're universally kind of beautiful representations of the human condition at the intersection of this surprising technology, which has just touched our lives in the most intimate ways. Um, we never went looking for it. It just kind of happened to us. And, and, and here we are. Yeah, I know a lot, some of the search engines I work with, they have like a strict set of rules that they say, you know, people they're helping, I will help you, but you have to follow these rules about- And what would the rules be like? 
I would like, you know, do not contact anybody on your list until I tell you to, um, things like that. You know, don't tell them you're doing this. You know, let's keep this under our eyes until such time as we have, right. you know, and they will actually help you with that letter because they've done it before and they, they'll get in touch with other search angels and say, well, we have to do this. You know, right. this is, yeah. 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 Because if you're, if you're, if you're contacting people like a second cousin and you're, and you're kind of saying the, situ the full extent of the situation, as you're in the process of discovery, it can get very, very messy. Yes. Because their then. Yeah. Their concern is that, you know, what if you get it wrong the first time. Right. And you tell that you show up on this guy's doorstep and you say, like, hey, I'm your son and you marriage. And then you turn out, whoops, sorry, I'm your son, I'm stay. Yeah, that's, which leads to this question. We uh, a question from Facebook here. Um, what are the main pri privacy concerns of DNA testing? Yeah, that's a good question. It can be answered in a number of different ways. Um, so there's the privacy concerns that have to do with things like um, insurance and, and like genetic discrimination and insurance. Um, so for instance, um, there's, a, there's a concern that let's say you do testing, like let's say you test yourself through 23andMe and let's say you get results that tell you you are at higher risk of early onset Alzheimer's for instance. And then given that knowledge, you decide to take out some additional insurance beyond what you would normally have taken out. So, um, you know, life insurance, disability insurance, long-term care. Um, and there are, there are federal protections against genetic discrimination for certain circumstances, but there are certain many kinds of insurance that, that these protections don't apply to. So for instance, um, disability insurance. There's a theoretical scenario in which um, an insurer gets a hold of your results somehow or asks you, have you ever undergone DNA testing, whether in the context of a, of a you know, medical visit or, or for recreational purposes? Uh, and you have to declare that you did or that you didn't. And if so, what were the results? If you decline to answer in theory, um, according to a legal expert I talked to, um, you know, your contract, if you, if you decline to tell them the truth that you were tested and you had these results, you know, your contract could be considered fraudulent if they ever find out. And if you tell them the truth, then they might decline to cover you. So that's for a, for instance, privacy concern that at the moment is abstract, but, um, you know, could be an issue going forward. Um, another kind of privacy concern has to do with the idea that, you know, this, this company that you've now, you've spit into a vial and you've sent it off. And now this company has all this information about you. And maybe you've read, maybe you sat down and you took hours and you read their privacy um, agreement, which I spent hours reading those of the major companies. Uh, it takes a very long time. And there's usually bullet points. And let's say you just read that and you're down with it. You feel like they're gonna protect your data. You feel like you can delete your kid at any time. Um, you are down with the idea that they're asking your permission to use their DNA for research purposes and that you can revoke your consent. Um, you're fine with all those situations. But let's say that then that company gets sold to another company in 10 years. And that company has different, different privacy policy that you never, um, you never would have consented to, but it's, it's too late now they own your data. So that is, uh, again, a kind of a, a scenario that is abstract and yet um, could be very real because we simply don't know um, what we don't know in terms of how this information is gonna be used in the future. And the third privacy concern has to do with the kinds of things that I'm particularly interested in that we've been talking about, which is, which is this question of family privacy, right? So what's, what's important to think about is that, um, is that you do not yourself need to test in order to be greatly affected and implicated by this technology. Yeah. Because my decision to test implicates, for instance, my brother. So if I have a brother and my brother, let's say he conceived a child uh, in high school and he didn't know it. Let's say he, he got his girlfriend pregnant and she didn't tell him. And now it is 30 years later and there's a child out there who's looking for him. He doesn't need to test. My decision to test means that that child can find me and see that I'm an aunt, which makes it very, mm -hmm. very easy to then find out all sorts of things about me and figure out my brothers and then, you know, figure out their identity and maybe write them each a letter. Mm -hmm. um, 
the information is not valuable on its own so much as it is in concert with the information that's available about us online. So my participation in social media, on Facebook, my presence, my, my, my online you know, digital trail that has been being kept on me since like say 1997 or whenever, um, you know, all of that is like super helpful um, and makes that, makes that match in a database that I'm this person's genetic aunt that much more powerful. So maybe my brother is happy to be contacted in this theoretical scenario. Maybe he's not. Maybe, maybe in some other scenario, a man donated sperm in the 1970s and he's being contacted by the 50 genetic children that he, he, you know, he, uh, he helped conceive and he like, doesn't, want this in his life or um maybe there's a woman who gave her child up for adoption and maybe the circumstances under which her child was conceived involved coercion or uh, a situation that at the time was very stigmatized because she got pregnant before she was married and that's sort of like was a shameful thing in the 40s and it's just it's kind of stayed with her um and maybe she never told her husband that she had a baby before they were married. And maybe their their marriage is, um, you know, predicated on this omission not becoming public. Yeah. Um, you know, these are really difficult, painful situations that really are about privacy. And and suddenly we have to kind of give up on our ideas about um, how much privacy we can have when it comes to these genetic family secrets. And that can be that can be really really difficult so you know one of the things i found was that those people who are the kind of product of of uh, of a situation that has been kept secret from them so they don't know about their own genetic origins like they didn't know the identity of their genetic father or they or they thought they did but then it turned out not to be the case um those people are almost universally of the folks that i interviewed uh, the hundreds of people I interviewed, almost universally glad to know. Provided that they tested themselves, that it was discovered on their own terms, they tend to have a sense of agency. Um, they tend to say, uh, you know, the truth is so valuable that even when it's painful, um, I'm glad to know the truth. Because why? Because it, it explains things I've wondered about since I was six years old. Um, because it makes that one thing that happened when I was 12 make sense. Because now I'm waking up with memories I haven't thought about in decades and all of a sudden everything has turned into a different light and I feel like I am you know temporarily kind of dislocated and don't know where I am and then after some time with processing I kind of have found a new orientation on this earth and and by the way you hear this language over and over again certain language about about a sense of rootedness uh, first a sense of dislocation or disorientation and then when their people are able to discover their genetic roots a sense of rootedness and and the language is fascinating there's so many commonalities in it um the the thing i'll say though is that 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 is not the case for the people who are being sought out i i tend to use this language of the seekers in in my in my book the seekers are the people who kind of fall down this rabbit hole of trying to find themselves through understanding the past or understanding their immediate families um and seekers are the people who are driving this, you know, and they're often the people who are discovering something about their own origins and they're, they're, they're looking to find out more. They may or may not want contact with their genetic family, often they do, but at the very least they want to understand more and they want to maybe research their genetic father and find out what his politics are before they decide whether to contact him. Um, but on the other side are the seekies. And they may be the keepers of the genetic secrets in, in many cases. And, and for them, um, it can be really threatening and painful um, to be sought out. Uh, it can have implications for their relationships with their spouses and their children. And so what you have is this really complicated scenario where two people who are intimately genetically related, right? Say if a, a, a parent and child, at the very beginning of their relationship, which is the most tender time, the most kind of um, vulnerable moment, those two people who are so closely related seem to have interests that are diametrically opposite. One person wants contact and transparency and openness, I'm your child. And the other person wants to shut it all down. And it's, it's a recipe for interpersonal disaster. It's really painful. And I'm not saying this is always the case. There are very many happy reunion stories. Yeah. But I think what people tend to read are the happy reunion stories 
Um, mm -hmm. you, read, you read great stories in the newspaper feature section about, you know, half, half siblings brought together and they lived on the same block for 10 years and they didn't know it or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and those stories are powerful and true and, and I'm not to diminish them at all, but there are many stories that do not have happy endings and are very complicated and can't be tied up with a little bow. And we need to be telling those stories too. I had at least one patron who called her birth mother and the birth mother said, you never call me again. I don't know, boom, so. But most, yeah, yeah. most of my stories have been at least happy endings or at least neutral endings, I guess you'd call them, yeah. Like a kind oh. of, a, just a kind of a, um, maybe like they don't have a relationship, but they kind of have like a, a you know, communication yeah. somehow. Yeah. It's not like the open armed situation that you're hoping for. Yeah, that's sometimes what you get is this mm -hmm. kind of gray area. All right, you talked about in past 2017. Um, let's talk about the far, far future here. Where do you see genetic testing in five years? So that's a good question. Um, there has been a pivot, which you may have read about, um, away from family history research and ancestry research towards more health-related and traits-related testing. Um, and the reason for that is, or at least the experts I talk to tell me that the reason for that is, that ancestry and family history research has really driven this industry for a very long time. And it has probably um, vacuumed up many of the early adopters who were willing to pay 99 bucks to do this, um, to find out more about how Irish they are, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. And that once those kind of early adopters were vacuumed up, the, co the companies had enormous growth. Like if you were to look at a, a kind of a, like a chart from like 2013 to, to 2018, it kind of went like this and then it went like that. And around 2019, it started, it's still growing, but it started to soften that, that slope. Um, and it was just absolutely unsustainable. I think they couldn't continue to just sell the, those many kits year after year. So the companies have pivoted towards um, offering more um, stuff that's, you know, related to, you know, uh, are you at risk of a particular disease? Are you a carrier? Um, and then the trait related stuff, you know, what kind of athlete are you? What type of earwax do you have? And, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a possibility that um, we're going to see more and more kind of conflation between the, um, the recreational DNA sector on the one hand, um, which is really like just independent companies that are, you know, traditionally didn't have much of a connection to um, the medical industry, particularly ancestry and my heritage. 23andMe always had more of a medical focus, but you're going to see more and more conflation between that and, you know, these, these private physicians networks, um, which, you know, are in the case of ancestry, for instance, um, approving these tests now. Uh, and maybe interpreting your results for you. And eventually what you may see is um, a coming together more so of the medical establishment and these private um, industries so that perhaps eventually someday um, you will get, uh, you know, you might, you might in theory go to your doctor and your doctor orders a test through Ancestry and that test is used to inform your medical care. Um, more so even than what happens now. And perhaps those tests, they seem to be already becoming more comprehensive um, and able to tell you more. And you're also seeing with 23andMe um, an increasing, uh, you know, results in terms of their ability to, um, you know, start developing drugs and start understanding disease because they have these very large databases of people that they can rely on to, to they contact them, the people fill out surveys and they can combine the genetic information with, with what's known as phenotypic data, which is the stuff that you self-report about, you know, the way you look and your diseases and, you know, you know, how you, whether you're, you're, um, you have restless leg syndrome or you um, have rosacea or, or things like that. Um, so you, so this, there you may see more of a coming together between those two worlds. Okay. Um, another question from the Facebook chat. Uh, what are the federal regulations for DNA collection? Are there federal regulations and how is it regulated? Do you know? Is it? Yeah. So, you know, it is, um, it is traditionally been in the United States, basically a wild west scenario. Um, and in the 2000s, you saw um, 
just like everybody and their brother kind of getting into this um, and offering all sorts of products that um, were of, you know, dubious value. Um, and there are kind of a patchwork of different agencies that can um, oversee this arena, but they have mostly been hands off in terms of um, kind of regulating it. Um, there's been more regulation of 23andMe because what they offer has been traditionally this medical advice. Um, company like Ancestry gets around their, this issue of regulation by partnering with a physician's network. Um, but something like HIPAA, for instance, which is the um, you know, health privacy law that you that kind of comes into force when you like go to the doctor and they have you sign a HIPAA form and it, it protects your information from prying eyes, something like that doesn't apply. Um, and, and that does get privacy experts concerned because you do have questions about um, you know, chain of custody with a test or um, you know, third party access or you know, what if the, the data is like breached somehow? Um, you, know, you, you see parents testing their children, um, maybe like infants even, um, and sending their DNA into a database. And then you wonder, um, bioethicists say, you know, that's not the greatest because you have to wonder about um, you know, what happens down the line if you find out that that child is at slightly higher risk of a particular thing, are you basically sentencing the parent and child to like a great amount of time of, of anxiety and shouldn't you wait till the child is 18 in order to make that decision and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, these are things like testing a child um, you know, just to, to find out how, you know, what their ethnicity pie chart is, or, you know, these are things that um, wouldn't take place in a medical setting. You know, you would typically, uh, a doctor would order test if there was a reason con for concern. And, and that can mean that sometimes there's, um, I mean, in general with this kind of testing, when you're looking at health related results, whether it's a child or an adult, it can mean that there's sometimes cases where you find out something you wouldn't otherwise find out and that saves your life uh, or, or you know, allows you to treat a condition that otherwise you wouldn't have been able to treat, like, um, like you know, detection of a, a BRCA1 mutation that's gonna lead to a higher uh, risk of developing breast cancer. And on the other hand, um, you know, there's concern about um, situations where um, either you know, somebody takes a test and they, they step away from the test saying, oh, I'm not at risk. I don't have to worry about it. I'm not going to go for my yearly mammogram when in fact the test was never comprehensive as given by recreational DNA testing. Or um, so that's what they call the walking sick um, or a scenario involving what they call the worrying well, which is um, cases where people think they have something and they don't. Uh, and the data is just so easy to access. Um, you can take your information, you can download it, you can upload it to a third party a site like um, Prometheus, and you can find out information that may or may not be that well vetted. Um, and um, you may wind up thinking you're at risk of something and you're not. So um, I hope that answers the question, gives you a sense of how, you know, how different this is than the information that's being gathered in a medical setting. And on a similar note, what are the possibilities or uh, scenarios involving fraud in DNA testing? Is there much fraud? How does it occur? It's a good question. I wonder what they mean by fraud. Is that that's a question yeah. from you or from Facebook? That, that's that's from Facebook. That's uh, I, yeah. I, was, I mean, you you have mentioned companies that have sold fraudulent or at least questionable medical oh, advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, maybe somebody manipulating data to yeah. You know, okay. Get so that definitely that definitely exists. Um. So there's a great story out of Canada. There was a company that, um, and I can't remember which Canadian newspaper reported this out. It wasn't my reporting. It was fantastic reporting. And if I could remember right now the name of the newspaper, I would I would say it. Um, but there was a company in Canada that was offering, um, you know, supposedly going to give you information about how much um, Indigenous or Native ancestry, Native Canadian ancestry, or Native American ancestry you had. And um, it was being used um, like by people who were attempting to claim ancestry who had like literally no connection and they were apparently using it. Um, I can't remember for tax purposes or something like that, but um, it, was, it was a company that was so 
kind of sketchy that at one point um, somebody sent in their dog's DNA um, for testing and they were told that their dog was 12%, you know, indigenous Abenaki or whatever. Um, so there are definitely those companies. Um, there's companies that off, oh God, there's just, there's just such a suite of companies that exist. If you go beyond the four major recreational mm -hmm. DNA testing companies, there's a category called surreptitious. I, I bet you want to know what that is. I bet you can probably figure it out, but it's basically where you send in an item of clothing, like a toothpick or a cigarette mm -hmm. butt or, you know, a t-shirt or whatever, um, to find out, I guess, who your woman's been sleeping with, <laughs> right? Like, or your man. Um, and it, the, the website that was offering that was filled with all sorts of misspellings, but they existed, whether or not they give you results, whether or not they then take your information and, and put it someplace else and sell it to someone. I mean, a lot of these, uh, fly by night DNA testing companies don't even have privacy or consent policies. Then there was a company called, um, who's your daddy, which, um, promised to, um, you know, tell you who your genetic father was, uh, or more information, I guess, that would lead you to identify who he was. Uh, and I should say that that's sort of distinct from like the paternity test that you can purchase at Walgreens. Um, and then there's legal paternity tests um, that you can use in a court of law. So there's, it's very much like a buyer beware environment. And like a legal paternity test is very, very different um, from a company like Who's Your Daddy, yeah. right? And um, you, you, there's very little protections for the consumer in terms of knowing whether who's your daddy <laughs> or serap the surreptitious DNA testing company is going to protect your data, is going to give you reliable results, um, is going to tell you that your dog is 12%, you know, native Canadian um, or indigenous. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a wild environment. Yeah. I know I saw one the other day that was going to craft a diet based on my genetic profile, like what foods I should be eating for better health or weight loss or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that has been something that's been promised for a long time. I don't think that they can offer that at this point, unless something's changed drastically in the last six months, um, which was the last time that I was like actively reading up on these diet based DNA. I mean, if, if they get there, it will, it, you know, I think we would all know it, right? I mean, because that would be like a huge breakthrough. But there's just there's so many um, un understanding genetics and the relationship between your genes and the environment. Um, it's so incredibly complicated, and I think we as human beings tend to think of genes as as fate, right? Like, oh, mm -hmm. I got the gene for this, and now I'm going to get this disease. We think about it in terms of a disease like Huntington's, which is like if you have uh, you know, if you have it, you're very likely to develop it. And it's, and, and, you know, it's a disease without, uh, much in the way of a solution. Um, but the reality is that most, um, conditions are, um, what's you know, probabilistic rather than deterministic. And, you know, they're very much connected to factors like, like smoking and lifestyle and things like that. Um, and how much you exercise and, and other factors that we may not even know. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's important to be really thoughtful about it and not sort of think about it in these terms of like that your, that your test is going to be like a, a, a fortune teller and then you're going to like be able to predict your, predict your future. Okay. Um, and what do you think are some of the implications of DNA testing for African Americans, particularly with regard to the history of slavery? Yeah, that's a great question. And you've probably seen this, I would imagine, um, when people come to you for the research, because before the 1870 federal census, um, enslaved persons were not referred to by name on those censuses. And so they would just be like a, a slash or a, a, tick, a tick mark, um, which makes genealogical research really difficult. Um, if you happen to be, there, there's a, there's a like a phrase that I used in the book that I think I borrowed from uh, somebody else where she talked about this idea that like records tend to coalesce around those with power, right? So, you know, what do you need to have records? Well, you need the government to consider you worthy of being recorded 
Uh, mm -hmm. You may need to be literate. You may need to have access to pen and paper. And these are all, and, and you need, you know, not to have been so displaced by war, migration, famine, you know, burned down churches and synagogues uh, that those records still exist. So, um, you know, what's interesting for me uh, in, you know, talking to um, African American genealogists is just how much DNA allows them access to the past, which, which previously they would not have had, access to information um, about where they came from before they were brought over in chains. Um, and that can be a really profound thing. And I think also, I mean, 23andMe has been doing really interesting research looking at um, the history of um, slavery and particular um, white owners, you know, exploiting and raping their their black slate female slaves um and that story is told through the genes we can see it um we can see um we can see how the you know we can we can see that those um those violent rapes kind of in in the genes of modern day um african americans mm -hmm. um and we can see also um the uh you know the presence of sub-Saharan African ancestry in, in white people who like would have assumed they were entirely white and in fact are not. And, you know, under the old one drop rule would have been considered black. So you can sort of see um, history written there. And I think it has um, led to some really important sort of historical reckonings on the part of, of hopefully white people as well as black people in terms of understanding how the traumas of history and the cruelties of history in this country um, are still with us today. And, and I think that's important because as I was talking about earlier, this idea of the immediacy of the past, um, the past isn't really over, right? And when you can see it in your own DNA, um, I think that brings it home to you in a way that you might not otherwise see it. And we're coming up on an hour here, so I have one last question, sort of bring it all together here. In your opinion, how much of family is the shared lived experience over generations and how much is biology? But how, yes. do, how do you balance those two in your own thinking? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yes, both. <laughs> um, I don't think this is a question that it's easy to answer, but I think it's, you know, <laughs> right, and it's, it's, it differs for each person. But mm -hmm. what I found over and over was a sense that this testing may be pushing us away from binary thinking in terms of this or that when it comes to family and when it comes to ethnicity. And I think that's hopeful because for as much as I do see situations where, um, where kind of families are divided by this stuff or they are kind of drawing strict divisions uh, this is my biological relative and, you know, that's my biological grandson. He's my real grandson. You do see that. Um, but I think I, I did also hear many stories about people who said, um, yes, DNA is important and it's not everything. And yes, um, you know, and also, yes, I have room in my heart for this newly discovered genetic relative. So, so both. And I see that too with um, understandings of identity when it comes to like ethnicity and race that it's not, we can be very selective about it. We are selective about it. That's part of our history. We were that way when genealogy was the only option and you couldn't do genetic genealogy because there was no DNA. We've always been selective about which branches we honor. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think, you know, there's this sense that, um, that, well, I'll just talk about Alice. Alice is the protagonist of the book. And she's the one who discovers that instead of being almost entirely British Isles and almost entirely Irish American, she's in ha fact half. And I think she would, you know, half, half that and half Ashkenazi Jewish. And I think she would say that like both things are important to her, right? Um, the lived experience, certainly, absolutely. It's like tied to her so much so uh, in, in like every memory of her childhood, right? With her parents and her, and her siblings. Um, but her understanding of the fact that she's half Ashkenazi Jewish like deepens and deepens and complicates that, and and I think in a good way for her. And she's forged relationships with her Jewish relatives. And I won't say like how like what her ultimate discovery is like. 
sorry, you have to read the book, uh, or you have to <laughs> ask someone who's read it, right? I'm about um, halfway through right now, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, but it's very much like a, there's a, there's a term in improv, right? It's, it's yes and, not no or but, but yes and. And I think like the answer to this question of like nature or nurture, um, it's, 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 it's both. And the reason I think then, the reason I think that this technology is so important in terms of our talking about it is because I think it raises essential human questions that all of us think about whether or not, um, whether or not we ever take a DNA test. Like, can you have room in your heart for two fathers, right? The man who raised you and the man who donated half your genetic material to you. And I've interviewed a lot of people who say, yes, of course, both. And I think that that's really hopeful. And I think it's leading us towards a way of looking at the world that's not this or that, but, but yes. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have any further questions from the, the Facebook live group? Anybody have any questions? Uh, apparently not. Um, well, uh, then I certainly want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to spend an hour with us. And uh, it's been a pleasure and I, sh I know I've learned a lot. And uh, uh, once again, thank you. It's been, yeah. it's been great. I, it's I've been happily... great. I wish I could come and like talk to you and like give you my, yes. my DNA results and have you help me understand them better because uh, I think that you're providing a, an incredible service. I'm yeah, I... jealous of all those people who get to go to you and bring, bring their results. I'm really a beginner in that. I'm, I've been in contact with some people who have been doing this for years and I mean on on a Facebook group that I'm in that's search angels and they're light years ahead of where I am right now it takes a particular kind of brain and I definitely don't have it um but there's a kind of brain that's really good at this kind of solving these kinds of puzzles and I'm envious of those who can do that, it that's the part I, I like the puzzle part and I love yeah. the logic parsing the logic but then I keep constantly having to remind myself remind myself that oh yes there's human beings behind all of this. You yeah, know? that's the complicated like part. Emotions <laughs> and yeah, lives. And I could change somebody's life if I say the wrong thing. So. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Any anyone? Nothing at all, huh? <laughs> I want to say something, which Please. is thank you so much for having me and um and support your local library. <laughs> By, and, by the way, yeah, the, yeah as, and, since you mentioned that, the book yeah. is called Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are. The library has several copies, and we have some electronic copies available through Overdrive and Libby, so you can check it out. I think there's no waiting right now. Oh, there it is. And um, you said you wanted to, you had a plug? I do, I do. So one of the things I've been trying to do is support independent bookstores because okay. they've suffered a lot during this time. So, um, you know, you can you can buy the book everywhere. It's available on Amazon, which is where, you know, a lot of people get their books. Um, and you can obviously get it at the library. If you're looking to support a local bookstore, um, there's a wonderful website called bookshop.org. And they are basically a consortium of independent bookstores. And you can order it through them as easily as you can through any place else. And they will ship it to you. Um, and if you want a signed book, because you want it made out to you or made out to a friend, because you want that experience of having been to a book signing, which is, you know, very 2019 and it's not happening anymore, sadly. Um, there is a bookstore near me in New York called the Village Bookstore in Pleasantville, New York. Village Bookstore in Pleasantville, New York. And um, if you call them up, their phone number is easily Googleable, and you ask for the owner, Jennifer, um, and you order a book through her, I will come to the store and I will sign the book to you or to whoever you like, and they will ship it to you. And then you have a signed book. So if that appeals to you, that's another option. All right. Once again, The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are. We've been talking with Libby Copeland for the last hour, who has been very generous with her time. And uh, I think this is going to go up online sometime in the near future. So if, okay. well, thank you, Libby. Um, thank you, David. Thank you so much. This has been such a thrill. Really, it has. Thank you. All right.